All right. Rimmer turned away from the screen and faced the others. He's dead. There's nothing we can do about it. Lister crumbled into the seat and flicked off the view screen. Ace was dead. He'd sacrificed his life for David Lister. He was worth a dozen of me, Lister mumbled. So what are we going to do? Are we going to let his death be a meaningless, empty gesture? Or are we going to pull ourselves together and work out a way to get out of this mess? Now, I never thought I'd be saying this, but I reckon our first priority is to rescue Crichton. That's assuming the Agonoid didn't kill him, of course. Now, let's run a quick check, make sure we're still spaceworthy, and get moving. Rimmer considered it most unlikely that Crichton was alive, but even if the Agonoid had literally ripped him to pieces, there might be a possibility of repairing him. In any case, they had at least to try and find him. A single unarmed Agonoid had accounted for their two strongest crew members in a matter of minutes without breaking sweat, and if it hadn't been for Ace's heroic sacrifice, they would all be people pate by now. The prospect of facing an army of them, with a force that consisted of one hologram and two pimply teenagers, was not one to be relished. Damn! The cat tapped at a readout dial on the pilot's control fascia. This readout better be busted. Rimmer stood and walked up to him. Which readout? Oxygen supply readout. The cat thumped it again. Either it's broken, or we only have five minutes of air left. Lister, can you run a cross-check on diagnostics? Lister sighed and turned to the controls. He punched in the necessary commands. Uh, guys, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is the oxygen readout isn't broken. That's also the bad news. We'd better get our helmets back on, sharpish. As he turned away from the controls, he noticed a warning light flashing. Hang on, we've got a visitor. Rimmer glanced over at the pilot's display. The airlock was being opened. I don't understand, that door's sealed. You'd need the access code and a retina scan. They heard the inner door open in the midsection behind them. Lister punched at the keyboard. Hey, it's all right. The Navicomps identified the retina scan. It's Crichton. Lister leapt up and bounded down the steps. He looked up and froze. It was Crichton all right, only he'd brought along some company. He was being held aloft, helpless by the scruff of the neck, by a leering, razor-toothed agonoid. I'm most awfully sorry, Mr. Lister, sir, Crichton fumbled with his fingers. He scooped me up in deep space, linked up to my CPU via my scuzzy socket, and dragged the access code out of me. Yes, the agonoid lowered Crichton to the floor. How unconscionably rude of me. He slapped Crichton viciously across the head, sending him scudding onto the scanner table, which shattered spectacularly on impact. I do hate bad manners, so uncalled for. He put his hands behind his back and strolled up to Lister, looking him over like a prospective buyer on a used car forecourt. Lister backed away. Oh, don't worry, I'm not going to kill you, John Keep cooed reassuringly. I'm going to hurt you a lot, and for a very long time, but I have no intention of killing you. In fact, it'll be a lot more fun for me if you live to a very ripe old age. We're going to become very close, you and I. He peered into the cockpit. You can come out of there. The cat shrugged and strutted into the midsection with considerable cool under the circumstances. The agonoid called. And you? The hologram cowering under that console at the front there. Lister heard Rimmer's small voice say, I don't think so. Jun smiled. It will hurt a lot less if you come out without my assistance. Slowly, Rimmer rose and walked out of the cockpit with his hands aloft. Why have you got your hands up? I'm surrendering. The agonoid sighed. <sighs> Look. I'd hate for us to get off on the wrong foot, so let me explain the setup as clearly as possible. There is no hope. There will be no mercy. You can't appeal to my better nature because I don't have one. The only thing you have to look forward to now is death, and believe me, you'll come to cherish that prospect. For my part, I will use my considerable skills to keep you alive and in constant agony. 
Any questions? Lister made eye contact with the cat, who nodded slightly to signal understanding. Good. Now we're going to take this ship back to the mining vessel, where I have assembled a considerable array of treats and goodies I'd like to share with you. Lister yelled, Now! and lunged at the agonoid as the cat dived towards a bank of lockers where a bazookoid was stored. Lister's flailing fists pounded at the agonoid's face, leaving his knuckles bruised and bloody. Jun simply reached out and flicked Lister's forehead and sent him crashing to the floor. He turned his attention to the cat, who cocked the bazookoid and aimed it at the agonoid's chest. Jun shook his head, amused. You must have your fun, I suppose, he stepped towards the cat. One more step, the cat swung his bazookoid's nozzle over towards the grounded Lister. And I kill him. Jun's smile collapsed. He looked over at the cat, then at Lister. Was this a serious threat? Could destiny be so heartless as to lead him all this way to bring the last human in the universe within his grasp, only to yank him away at the last possible moment? Suddenly there was a hiss and the sound of fans grinding to a stop. Jun looked up. Something had happened to the oxygen supply. He wheeled round aghast. The human was on the floor hyperventilating. Even in his distress, he grinned at Jun, and with his last gasp of air said, You lose, motherfucker. Should be breathing now. Ah, yes. Lister opened his eyes to see Jun Keep's face looking down at him. The face disappeared into a fog as Lister's breath misted over his helmet's visor. The agonoid stood. Unfortunately, there's very little air left in your canisters. Certainly not enough to get you back to my pain palace in one piece. And I do so want you in one piece. At least for the moment. Lister sat up and looked around. They were in Starbug's engine room, facing the newly welded hull section. The cat was crouching on Lister's left, wearing his gold lame spacesuit. Rimmer and Crichton were seated meekly on the deck to his right. The agonoid was standing opposite, prodding at the oxygen regeneration unit with a sonic screwdriver. Ah, here's the problem. This OR unit is a complete mess. I'm surprised it held out as long as it did. Just bear with me a moment. There was a clunk and the sound of fans whirring up to speed overhead. There, that should hold until we get back. Now then. The agonoid crossed to the Navicomp terminal, opened up a small panel on top of his head and dragged out a lead. He plugged the lead into the terminal. I'll program in the course, and we'll be on our way. Crichton stood. Sit down. Ignoring the agonoid's bark, Crichton walked calmly along the corridor. Get back here, you plastic-faced buffoon! Crichton stooped under a gantry support strut and grabbed something off the deck. He turned round again and began walking back towards the agonoid. He was holding a bazookoid. Honestly, Jun smiled, incredulous. What are you going to do with that? Even if you hit me at point-blank range, it would hardly scratch me. Besides, you're programmed not to kill. Crichton shook his head. I'm not going to kill anyone. Then put it down before you hurt yourself. Crichton looked at Lister and widened his eyes. Hold on, he yelled, and fired. The blast ripped into the new hull section, and a roaring vacuum wind dragged at the air. The bazookoid tore out of his hand and tumbled through the hole. Crichton snatched hold of a gantry girder and yanked at Rimmer's light bee, but he was too slow, and Rimmer's translucent form was flung wide-eyed out of the ship into the permanent silence of deep space. His last words, perhaps not as poetic or as majestic as he would have liked, were lost in the howling scream of escaping oxygen. For the record... They were. Nice plan, Critters, you Brontosaurus marital aid. Lister grabbed onto the strut behind him, but the cat was caught unawares and he'd slithered beyond reach of a handhold before he could react. Lister leaned over and grabbed hold of the cat's boot. Jun had been closest to the blast. The sucking whirlwind lifted him off his feet and dragged him towards the gaping hole. As he flew through the gap feet first, his fingertips caught hold of the edge of the ripped panels and he dangled there for a brief second before the weakened metal crumbled away and his arms clawed impotently at the air as he swept through and out into space. He jerked to a stop within ten yards of the ship. 
Crichton looked over at the Navicomp and saw why. The lead from the Agonoid's head was still plugged into the terminal. It looked like the cat was in grabbing distance of the lead. Crichton yelled out, but his voice couldn't carry over the roar. He waved and gesticulated frantically to Lister. Lister spotted him, followed his gestures towards the taut lead, and understood. Straining and grunting, he dragged his leg back and hooked his knee around the strut, freeing his hand to activate his throat mic. Catman! The lead! Pull the lead out! The cat looked up. He reached out. His fingertips were more than six inches short. Lister hooked his boot behind his support strut. He couldn't be absolutely sure if it was wedged firmly enough to hold both him and the cat, but the Agonoid had grabbed onto the lead and was hauling his way back towards them, so there was no choice but to try. He let go and was yanked forward. He looked back. A boot had held. How long it would hold, he couldn't be sure, but now the cat could reach the lead. He watched the Agonoid leer at him as the cat stretched up and tugged the lead free. The wire snaked out of the ship and the escaping air that was roaring from the ship blasted the Agonoid away from them. He waved at them as he slowly disappeared into the cold, eternal night. Suddenly, Lister felt himself move forward. He looked back, but the boot still seemed to be wedged behind the strut. He slid forward again. The entire gantry was being sucked towards the hull. On the plus side, that might work to their benefit. It might jam the gap sufficiently for them to get topside. On the negative side, the huge bulk of collapsing metal might very well crush one, or all of them, to death. He watched helplessly as the girders groaned and bent and finally snapped, and the gantry crashed down towards him. Lister closed his eyes. Suddenly there was silence, save for the laboured hum of the oxygen regeneration unit. Lister opened his eyes. The collapsed gantry was wedged into the hull, sealing the hull. The cat was safe. They both stood. Lister picked his way over the debris. He saw Crichton's arm under a girder, the hand twitching spasmodically. He grabbed the girder and pulled. He moved it just enough to see that Crichton was crushed beyond repair. Gingerly, Lister peeled back his skull section. Ugly black smoke wisped up from inside. The circuits were charred and warped. The cat peered over his shoulder. Bad as it looks? he asked. Lister nodded, eyes stinging. Yes. Clayton and Rimmer are both totaled. But before Lister could even begin to assimilate the appropriate emotion, the siren awooged its red alert warning. The cat yelled, Now what? Lister slipped Crichton's skull piece back reverently, then hobbled over to the Navicomp terminal. He stabbed at the keypad. Smeg, he hissed. Now we're in trouble. The Agonoid programmed a bug to head full thrust towards a major collision risk with less than 17 minutes to impact. Major? How major? Catman, it's a planet. When he reached the cockpit, the cat was already jabbing at the controls. Lister slid into Rimmer's navigation station, trying not to think of the fact that Rimmer was gone, and so was Crichton. Yet another friend had sacrificed his life for Lister. He'd better make damn sure it wasn't a hollow gesture. He powered up the station. The planet they were hurtling towards filled the screen. Less than fifteen minutes to impact. We're too close to steer away. Better slam on the anchors pronto. But it, I am so far ahead of you, you can't see me with an atomic-powered telescope. The cat reached out and fired the retros. They'd been constantly accelerating now for several hours, and even with the retros on full power, their forward motion was hardly impeded. The cat turned to Lister, flustered. What's happening, bud? I'm hitting maximum reverse and it ain't working. It is. We're slowing down. The cat's eyes raced over his readouts. Well, we're not slowing down fast enough to save my box of shots from major laundry work. No, it's okay. I think we're going to make it. Think? Define think. Well, according to the Navicon, we'll stop completely in just under 13 minutes. That's so long as the fuel supply holds out. The cat checked the fuel readout. They were at the bottom of the red. The Navicomp prediction was that, at full thrust, they had just under 12 minutes fuel. Well now, I'm no math genius, bud, 
but those numbers do not fill me with good cheer. Lister shook his head. There's always more left in than the computers reckon. You're sure? Lister looked the cat straight in the eyes. I'm betting me life on it. And there was nothing to do then but wait and watch the arid face of the oncoming planet slowly reveal its geographical features. Geographical features of which they would become a part if Lister was wrong. After three years that lasted for ten minutes, the cat said, Well, that's it, bud. We're registering empty. But the retros were still firing. Twenty seconds. Forty seconds. And the jets sputtered and died. Lister stared at the velocity readout. They hadn't stopped. They'd slowed dramatically, but they were still drifting towards the planet's gravitational field. Once that grabbed them, they'd be accelerating again, to an inevitably lethal collision. Impact in 33 minutes. Well, the cat flung up his hands. That just about rounds off a perfect week. We're not finished yet. Not finished yet? Get out your street map and look up Reality Central. There is no way we're getting out of this in one piece. Or, if we are, it's going to be one big flat piece. There's still wildfire. Come on. He staggered up to the midsection and started slipping into his spacesuit. The cat pitched out after him. Lister yelled, Suit up! The cat tottered to his locker and grabbed his suit. What's that about wildfire? Lister hauled himself into his leggings. Easy ship is still tethered outside. The cat yanked on his alarmingly light oxygen tank. So what's the plan? Lester sealed his collar and tugged on his gauntlets. We're going to try and shimmy up the tether. If we can make it up to wildfire, we'll cut ourselves loose and whammo, we've got ourselves a working ship. Lester dug out his oxygen tank. Seven minutes of air. The cat had nine. Would that be enough? Lester shrugged and clamped on the tank. They were fresh out of choices. He sealed up his helmet and stepped into the airlock. Outside, the face of the planet looked shockingly large. They scrambled up the roof with magnetic clamps and scurried over to the point where Commander Rimmer's ship was anchored to Starbug. The cat went first. Despite his injured leg, he made it look easy and was halfway up before Lister moved. Lister didn't find it quite so straightforward. When he finally clambered within grabbing distance of Wildfire's cockpit, he had 51 seconds of oxygen left. He tumbled into the cockpit and squeezed in on top of the cat. His eyes raced across the control fascia. It was all disturbingly unfamiliar. Where's the damn cockpit cover control? He saw the lever by his left hand and reasoned it controlled either the cockpit cover or the ejector seat. He pulled it anyway. The cockpit swung down, squashing him onto the cat. Lister's air ran out. He sucked, but nothing came. It occurred to him that the craft might not be fitted with its own oxygen regenerator. He ran his eyes over the controls again, but he was beginning to feel light-headed and his vision was getting giddy. He leaned in closer. There was a switch marked OR. It was either OR or QP, but Lister had given up caring. He flicked it anyway and tugged off his helmet. And breathed. He spent a few moments making sense of the controls, and when he thought he'd grasped them, he pressed the button that shot loose the tethering line. The cat saw that Lister was breathing successfully and took off his own helmet. You reckon you can fly this thing? Lister shrugged. Looks self-explanatory. Everything's marked up. Tertiary, secondary, primary ignition. A lot of it's computer-controlled anyway. So, we head back for Red Dwarf? Lister shook his head. What's there for us now? My entire suit collection, for one thing. There's no Holly, no Crichton, no Rimmer. True, but on the bright side, there's no Rimmer. Besides, where else can we go? We can go anywhere. Huh? Ace has programmed this little baby for another dimension jump. I reckon we fire her up and see where she takes us. Where's that going to be? Dunno. Don't think Ace knew himself. Another place, another dimension. Somewhere along our own destiny lines where our lives took a different path. You up for it? The cat shrugged. I have no particular plans for the rest of this reality. Right then. Lister leaned forward and flicked on his tertiary ignition. 
Let's see what's out there. A combination of the intense G-force and Lister's generous buttocks crushing him down rendered the cat blissfully unconscious for the jump between dimensions. When he came to, he was more than happy to be in one piece and apparently still breathing. Did we make it? Lister hunched his shoulders. As far as I can tell. Then where are we? Lister looked down at the control panel, but the readouts were blank. No idea. The panel's down. Radar's dead. Well, wherever we are, we are getting out of this cockpit, bud. I am so badly crushed, they're going to have to dig my testicles out of this seat with a pickaxe. Hang on. The control display flickered. Coming back online. Radar shows something fairly huge close by. About six miles long and three miles wide. If it's a ship, it could be. The computer screen indicated an incoming message. Lister flicked on the comms panel. Ship, repeat, calling unidentified ship. Come in, please. It was Rimmer's voice. This is the mining ship Red Dwarf. You have encroached on our airspace without warning, which we must consider an act of aggression. Ergo, we surrender. Totally and unequivocally. Do you copy? Lister grinned and switched to send. Rimmer, you are such a world-class meghead. Lister? Switching to visual. Rimmer's image appeared on the screen. He peered forward, baffled and confused. Lister? Crichton squeezed in beside him. Sir, is it you? It's me. Rimmer said, How can we be sure it's you? Tell us something only you could know. Lister thought. I know gazpacho soup is served cold, he tried. Rimmer gritted his teeth and nodded violently. It's him all right, the obnoxious little gimboid. Crichton looked perplexed. I don't understand, sir. You're dead. We buried you some time ago. You and the cat. You were both trapped in a lethally addictive game. There was nothing we could do to save you. The cat poked his head over Lister's shoulder. Who are you calling dead, dog chew head? You're both alive, but how? We'll tell you when we get on board. If we don't get out of this ship soon, the cat's conkers are going to be crushed beyond recognition. Well, Rimmer's forehead wrinkled. You picked a rare old time to show up. We're about to be. Crichton cut him off. There'll be time aplenty for that, sir. He leaned towards the screen. Head for Docking Bay... Four seven five, sir. I'll have a cocoa pops and vindaloo sauce sandwich waiting for you. Signing off. Lister sighed with his entire body. They'd encountered a dimension where he and the cat had died playing better than life, where Rimmer and Crichton had never entered the game to rescue them. It wasn't quite what he'd been hoping for, but it was better than the dimension he'd left behind. At least Crichton, Rimmer, and presumably Holly were still around. Lister grabbed the throttle stick and brought Wildfire around in a slow, lazy arc. For as long as he could remember, all he'd wanted was to get back home. He'd always considered that Earth was his home. But as the ugly red brute of a ship loomed into view, he felt a tingling in his stomach and thought maybe he'd been wrong. Maybe this was home. The rear jets flared and Wildfire looped gently towards the docking bay. Epilogue. The Difference. Two. Arnold J. Rimmer, aged seven and almost five-sevenths, is crouching at the starting line for the Junior C 200 yards dash. His sports kit, handed down from his brother Howard, is two sizes too large, but Arnold has spent the last three evenings sewing, and though his needlework leaves a lot to be desired, his stitches too large and uneven. The shorts and T-shirt hug his body tightly. His spiked running shoes are padded at the back with heel grips he's made for himself out of paper mache, and the fit is snug. There are seven other boys at the starting line, and there's no doubt in anyone's mind that Rimmer will beat them all. He has an unfair advantage over them. While the rest of his class of the previous year have moved up to Junior B, Young Arnold Rimmer has been deemed scholastically unsuitable to join them. He's been kept down. All his mother's entreaties failed to impress the headmaster, 
and he spent the last three terms in a class where he's a good foot taller than the rest of the kids. And, to everyone's astonishment, Arnold has started to excel. The arithmetic that had seemed so ungraspable to him a year before has now become a breeze. The second time around, he actually understands his French lessons. He's even begun to develop a knack for the piano. He looks to his left for the starter to signal marks, and Bull Heinemann winks at him. A year ago, Rimmer had belonged to the Chap Legs and Doctor's Note Brigade when it came to ball games. Nowadays, he's the one who picks the teams. He's one of Bull's blue-eyed boys. Nowadays, he's a leader. He made a tough decision when his mother failed to save him. He decided, since he couldn't rely on his parents, he'd better start relying on himself. He could either wallow in shame and self-pity at being kept down, or he could roll up his sleeves and get stuck into making something of his life. He discovered that the twelve inches he had over his classmates didn't single him out for ridicule. It made them look up to him. And already today he's won first place medals for seven events. Winning the 200-yard dash will net him a school record. He will have surpassed all the achievements of all of his brothers. Not that they'll hold it against him. They'll be there at the finish line, cheering him on like blue thunder, slapping his back when he wins and carting him off on their shoulders to the winner's podium. His mother will be there too, of course. Not cheering, a thing so undignified. She'll watch him break the black and yellow once again, and when he's looking over, she'll favour him with the familiar nod. Then she'll turn and walk to the refreshment tent, and when he's collected his medal, he'll follow her there, and she'll have a chilled lemonade waiting for him. And she won't say congratulations or well done, but while he's sipping his well-earned drink, she might brush a stray lock of hair from his forehead, and that will be enough. And suddenly, Rim is aware that the boy on his right is mumbling. He turns. It's Bobby Derrick. His eyes are screwed up like a newborn puppy's. Rimmer can't quite make out what the kid's saying, but it sounds as if it could be a whispered prayer. He's a good sprinter, little Derrick. Rimmer usually picks him first for team games, partly because of his speed and partly because the boy's parents divorced just before Christmas and his father leaving home has been pretty tough on him. The boy opens his eyes and glances nervously across at the spectators. Rimmer follows his glance and sees a man wave in his direction. Bobby turns back and sets his eyes on the track before him. His teeth are clenched. His knuckles whiten against the red clay. And the whistle blows and Rimmer hoists off his front leg instinctively. Before the slowest starter has left the line, Rimmer is three strides ahead of his nearest rival. He can hear his brother's raucous yells as he pounds away at the track, his arms and legs pumping rhythmically in sync, his breathing easy and measured. And, though it's not the thing to do, as he crosses the hundred-yard mark, he chances a look over his shoulder. Bobby Derrick is right behind him. His face is purple with exertion. His balance is wrong. His arms are windmilling around. He's not keeping up with good technique. He's keeping up with sheer willpower. Rimmer looks forward again. He finds another gear and pulls away. And with thirty yards to go, he looks back. Derek must surely be digging deep into reserves Rimmer didn't know he had. He's two paces behind, running for all he's worth. And he doesn't stand a chance. Even if he keeps his mad pace up, there simply isn't enough track left for him to make up the gap. And suddenly, Rimmer understands that Derek has to win this race. He simply has to. Falling over and making it appear like an accidental trip is not the easiest thing to do, but Rimmer is determined to make it look good. He slides his front foot slightly too far over and manages to catch his heel with the toe of his oncoming shoe. It is a spectacular enough tumble. He crashes headlong onto the clay just yards from the tape. And to his horror, his momentum sends him skidding forwards, skinning his knees and propelling him towards the line. For one awful moment, it looks like he's going to win anyway, but little Derek drags some extra effort from some hidden place and breasts the tape just inches before Rimmer's skidding nose. Derek collapses spent to the ground and Rimmer tumbles into him. The purple-faced boy opens his eyes and looks into Rimmer's face. He smiles and says, Thanks, Ace. Rimmer curls his forehead. 
Nonsense, old sell sport. Fair and square. He offers his hand, and the two boys help each other to their feet. Rimmer looks down at his raw knees. He tests his weight on his right ankle and winces. He'll be limping for a week. His brothers crowd around him, offering commiserations and inspecting his injuries. Over their shoulders, he spots his mother. She's looking at him, puzzled. Her head tilts slightly to one side. She's asking him why. Rimmer simply smiles and shrugs. After all, losing isn't nothing.